Welcome to our session on the introduction to basic concepts and techniques of statistical research. Um, today, we're just going to do basic ba touch ups. It's not going to go into detail explaining a lot of things, just to get you to understand the the concepts used when you do um, a quantitative research, as well as the, some of the techniques that you need to be aware of when you embark on your studies or when you are doing your research as well, whether it's part of studying or not. So our session is scheduled to end at 12, but we might end early depending on the engagement and how fast we go through everything. And, the recordings will be shared um, on YouTube channel. You can follow us so that you can go and subscribe so that you can gain access to the recordings. So who we are as Pambilla Analytics, uh, our vision is to build a community of youth and women mostly uh, who have dig uh, the digital and data skills needed to become more of data driven uh, people or leaders in within whatever the industry they are operating in. Our mission is to bridge the data literacy, especially the numeracy and digital literacies, but more building the analytical skills gap by training, mentoring and coaching individuals and preparing citizens to enter a digital driven um, global environment. We know that with the rise of 4IR, everybody needs to have those skills that will make them compete and be able to prosper in this digital era. Um, your facility, oh, some of the first, uh, the services that we offer, it's in terms of training in, uh, with regards to business intelligence, data analytics, research and market research, depending on the research question that you have, whether is it um, your studies or is it business oriented um, questions. Um, and then mostly where we operate, it's more about skills development and training in the digital and data literacies. Your facilitator for today, it's me, Elizabeth Boy. Uh, I've got more than 20 years experience in the data analytics and management information, as well as business intelligence. I have been tutoring for more than 13 years or offering quantitative numeracies and tutoring in the uh, research, statistical and numeracy skills. Um, I'm currently also a Sia Pumelela coach, uh, which we gear towards um, addressing issues that deals with student success, because we know that this is a challenge. Many um, students go into the university, but they struggle to complete their degrees in minimum time or minimum time plus one, and some eventually drop out, which also is a loss and it's, a, um, it's uh, also a burden for either the person who went to the university or their family, and also in terms of um, our country, we are losing those um, intelligent, uh, intelligent people that could bring or help us develop our economy. Because when students drop out, therefore it means they've got limited opportunities, not that they cannot strive without a qualification, but we're trying to also make sure that we keep students in higher education so that they can leave the higher education with a qualification um, at least. Uh, and I'm also a two-time award um, an, an enterprise or entrepreneur award winner. Of, um, I was the 2022 top uh, Western Cape business entrepreneur of the year. And I was um, the national champion for the business leverage. And uh, last year, I was one of the top 10 finalists in the MT and Women in Digital Business program, uh, which is still ongoing and the winner will be announced this year. Um, as in terms of experience and in terms of tools I've used, I've got uh, diverse 
um, experience in using tools in the business intelligence side, in the data analytics side, as well as in the visualization. As you can see, all the types of tools that I've used across all the years of experience that I have been. I've worked in multiple companies. I know uh, this might uh, not be good because I might it might be telling you how old am I. But I've worked in multiple ex, um, companies, as you can see, from different sectors, including higher education, insurance, credit bureaus, financial. So I've got um, experiences, as, um, but not in the health. Uh, so, yeah, that's me. I'm also a founder and a managing director of Pambilla Analytics, which is the company that is running this course. What we're going to go through today is going to be an engaging session, and you are more than welcome to stop me anytime and ask any question if you don't understand. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some basic concepts, uh, especially statistical concepts, as well as the techniques needed in order for you to undertake a statistical research or what we deem to call it a quantitative type of a research. Um, the learning objectives for today or some of the topics that we will go through today will cover those basic concepts, explaining the terminologies behind those concepts. We're going to look at what is the difference between a descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. We're going to look at the difference between a population and a sample, because when you're doing research, you need to understand those terminologies as well. Then we're also going to learn about uh, the sampling techniques. I've only curated and selected three of those, but there are so many uh, sampling techniques that you need to know. But for today, we're going to only com concentrate on the probability uh, sampling techniques um, as well. And I will also emphasize on the importance of using those sampling techniques. And lastly, we're going to talk about how to use hypothesis testing, to do your research because the base of everything that you need to do is to test your theory and to test your um, assumptions as well. So we're going to go through those, but also how to start thinking about what is it that you want to test as well. And we will go through a decision tree that will help you guide your thinking around how do you formulate your research and how do you formulate your research questions and hypothesis as well. So let's dig in. Uh, before we dig in, are there any expectations that you have from the topics that I'm going to cover today? Are there any other expectations that you had that I am not covering that you think that we might include? Or are you good with the topics that we have? I'm good. Okay, cool. So we're going to continue. Uh, I just want to get a book, right? So when we talk about uh, quantitative research, uh, we also, or research in a way, uh, it's more about a scientific process because there need to be some steps that needs to take place. So with a scientific process, it starts when you pose a research question. And it's very important that you understand what your overarching research question is. You cannot just start your research without knowing what is it that you want to um, test or you want to prove because it's all about proving something, proving a phenom phenomena that is happening. So what is that question that you want to ask yourself? And this will help you to better understand what is it that you need to be studying. And to understand that phenomena, you need to generate possible explanations because those possible explanation will become your assumptions that you, are, you want to test. Uh, from that uh, possible assumptions, you might also want to create some prediction because you might want to look at whether um, something is related to the other, or you might want to look at um, uh, forecasting or looking at the future as well. But most importantly, you will need to collect data in order for you to be able to test those phenomena. 
or to taste those explanations or to answer that research question. And to do that, you need to identify the type of data. I know that I'm introducing some of the terminologies that you might not be aware of, but we will unpack all those terminologies, especially those ones where I have highlighted them. The type of data that you will need to answer that research question, it's very important to understand that because also uh, when you understand the type of questions that or the type of data that you need, then you will be able to ask the right questions as well and formulate them in a way that they will help you to answer that research question. Then after you have collected your data, you need to start analyzing your data. And to analyze it, you will really need to understand some of the techniques for analyzing the data. For example, whether are you just want, do you just want to describe your data, summarize it and uh, describe it um, purely in terms of putting it in nice graphs and charts or calculating some measures, or do you want to um, do those prediction where you need to then look at some of the techniques, uh, including the correlation, the regression, the t-test and all that. So you need to understand those terminologies, you need to understand those techniques in order to uh, for you to know what is it that you are looking for to answer those research questions that you have. Right. And to analyze uh, the data, you may uh, need to make sure that those data, uh, when you are analyzing them, they support some of the hypotheses. So they should always be a link between your data analytics and your hypothesis testing. So you cannot say you're going to test the correlation, but only just do um, a bar charts and pie charts. There is no correlation between those because we know that a correlation will need you to do a scatter plot and so on. So that is why it is very important for you to understand the type of data that you have. And also to create those scatter plot, you need numerical data. So if you only have categorical data, you cannot use that kind of information to create uh, your scatter plot. So you need to understand the type of data. As you can see, all of this, and it is a cyclical process. Therefore, it means every level that you go through, you can always go back and refine. There's nothing that says it is a cut, uh, uh, cutthroat. Uh, it stays like that and um, it is. No, you can always go back and reiterate and change based on what you see on the data. Because if you do your data analytics and you find out that the data that you collected does not actually answer your research questions, you might also go back and go and look at your research questions and start um, redefining your research questions so that it aligns with the data that you collected. But if you, if you created a proper research question and put in place the proper mechanism to collect your data so that they are able to answer your research question, then when you get to the data analytics process, you don't have to go back to your hypothesis because all you just need to do is to just validate that your, your data analytics and your hypothesis do relate or you are able to answer those or you are able to test those assumptions that you created. Once you have done your data analytics, then the next process is to share your results, write your conclusion, your discussion, and you make your decision out of it. And that is not what we're going to be discussing for, to, for the purpose of today. So for today, we're going to be dealing with the hypothesis, the data collection, and the data analytics pro, uh, processes, not the initial theories that you have, including also the discussion and the conclusion. That would be another discussion on its own. And all these parts actually also through our processes in terms of research literacy, we are going to touch and expand on them in more detail so that you are able to do your research or you are able to complete your studies, understanding all the concepts in depth. Okay, so 
let's move on and now look at what are the key components or key terminologies unless if there is another question or you have a question to ask to ask based on what we just discussed yeah is there any question no not at the moment Ooh. so what are the terminologies or research concepts that you need to understand and learn when you undertake research? One, you need to understand what is it that you want to measure. Uh, measurement are uh, a way of allocating numbers according to a rule in order to quantify some constructs. And constructs can be any um, variable or any concept that you want to derive. For example, let's say you want to test people's depression um, score, how depressed everyone is at. So you will have to assign some numbers in terms of you testing the depression level of everyone. So to create, to quantify that construct called depression, you will need to allocate a number to it or sometimes a construct you can allocate um, not just a number but a label to it but in order to measure something uh, there is a way that you must make sure that you are able to operationalize that measure so for example like i said if i'm going to measure the level of depression that everyone is going through um, then I will put a score to say those who are, have low depression will have a score between zero and three, and those with mild depression might have three to five, and so on, and so on. And then after that, then I will create some measure from it and calculate how many people also have depression and so on, and that will or maybe probably let's put it this way. I will ask different questions that will help me to create those measures. So for example, there might be a five point scale um, questions that relates to how, uh, how people are behaving or how they're feeling and all of those questions when I um, summarize them or add them together or average them, they create this one measure called a depression level. And that's how you're going to be saying you are operationalizing those measures. Now we're talking about like things like a construct, and I said it um, it describes uh, this level that you want to measure. And those things sometimes we call them variables. And a variable is just a characteristic that describes an item. So for example, some characteristics are visible, some characteristics are not visible. Some characteristics we can observe them, some characteristics we can measure them. Like for example, depression level, we will be able to measure that because we will create a measure for it. But things like a characteristic like uh, the um, color of my eyes, those you can observe because you can look at my eyes and say my eyes are brown or black or the color of my skin you can say it's black or white depending on how we define the color of the skin or let's use something different cars so some characteristics of a car over um, that we are able to see is the color of a car the model of a car the uh, type of a car, whether is it a sedan, a or is it um, a van, is it an SUV, is is it a coupe, things like that, because you are able to observe them. Uh, when something is visible, we call it a manifest variable. When it is invisible. Because things like whether I'm happy or not, you cannot see that. Uh, whether I'm stressed or not, you cannot see that. We call those things 
latent variables as well. So you need to understand when you and uh, create, for example, a question, you need to be able to say what are those type of variables that you have or you're going to ask people to respond to? Are they going to be manifest variables or are they going to be latent variables? And that will also help you because if you're going to be asking questions about um, whether you want to, uh, your research question is about finding out, uh, you want to know uh, the level of the uh, stress level of individual working at this company. You will need to use some questions that are that relates to those latent um, variables as well. Um, and you can also use some variables that relate to manifest variables because they, those variables will be visible, for example, like gender, race, education level and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've been talking about the variable and we said it is a characteristic that describes an item or an individual and it can be observed or it can be measured. So when we start observing things and we uh, say these are the values that comes from that, we are referring to what we call the data points or data. So sometimes we use these words interchangeably, variable data, variable data, variable data. We use them interchangeably, but data is actually the values from those variables. So the values that comes out of a variable or those measures, I can call them measures, but those are set of individual values associated with the variable. For example, like I said, if I look at the type of a car I'm driving, uh, the type is a variable. The data would be a coupe, a van, a sedan. Those are the data values because those data values, they are associated with that variable that I am looking at. So when when we discuss data and variables, sometimes some books, sometimes they use them interchangeably, but I think for the purpose of this session, we are going to be talking about data than talking about the variable, but we are talking about data and variable at the same time because data is just the value from that, that is associated with that variable. I hope you do understand that. So, when you know the type of data that you are working with, so there are two types actually of data. We only talked about uh, the data being um, values. So there are two types of those data points that you can link or separate. The first one is what we call a quantitative data point. And a quantitative data point is that data that is numeric in nature. It's something that you can count or you can measure. So it has two characteristics. You can count it or you can measure it. The minute you count that data, then it becomes what we call a discrete data because you are counting it. Like the number of children I have, I can count them. That is discrete data. It's discrete. The minute I measure, I take a measuring tape and I, I measure my height, I call that a continuous data. So you need to understand those two types because the minute you understand them, you will be able to know how to use them and what measure or what statistical method you can apply on those. But it's not the purpose of today. You just need to know that there are under the quantitative numerical, there are discrete or continuous data points. There is also another category of data, which is called a categorical data. That type of data, it's data that you can put in categories or classify into categories. 
Like for example, the types of schools we have, we've got independent schools and government schools or things like that. We can call them government schools and independent schools or what we call uh, CAPS uh, and government schools. Or uh, in higher education, we, we also classify schools in terms of the levels or the, the levels of schools we have in terms of quintiles. So we say quintile one to three, are those under resource schools and quintile four and five are well resourced schools because quintile one and quintile two are non fee paying schools the majority of time because they rely on the government and quintile three they pay 50 50 or some some sort they've got a support from government but they also do charge fee and then quintile four and five they students who go to those schools the majority of time those schools, even though they do get government support, but the majority of time the fees parents pays for those ones. So those we call them the, the high level or the well resourced schools. So because I'm able to classify those schools in those categories, then that means that variable that I use, the, the type of school, it's what has the values of quintile one, two, three, and four they are categorical data within it. Now, when you understand those things, you also need to understand the levels, the levels of measurement of those data. So when we look at numerical, remember numerical are those that we can measure or count. When we look at those ones, they can be classified under four, uh, the two scales, ratio, which uh, with a ratio where the distance between the numbers is known. For example, when I look at the scale, when I measure myself, if I've got a zero kg, it means I don't exist. So there is a difference between that where true zero exists. Therefore, it means if I have a zero kg, it means I don't weigh anything, I don't exist. So zero means something, means nothing. Or oh, it has a an actual meaning that there is no other thing beyond or before zero. It starts from zero and it goes up. Interval, in a way to understand that, it's also, you are able to, do, to find the distance between the numbers, but that distance, even though it's known and it's constant in time, there is no definite meaning of zero. Zero is just another number. For example, temperature. So when we go below zero to minus degree, uh, minus four degrees Celsius and so on, 20, minus 20 degrees Celsius, zero means another temperature. It means it's cold but it's not colder than minus 20 or minus 14 or minus four. So it's not a definite, definite thing. It means it's another cold temperature. Then when we look at categorical data, which are those data that we can classify and place into categories, you need to understand that those data, they form two levels, they've got two levels of measurement or skills of measurement. The first one is the ordinal, which means you can place the data into order from lowest to highest in a rank. For example, like if we look at it in a questionnaire type of a format, we might say rate our service from uh, zero to five or from one to five, where one means poor and five means excellent. Therefore, it means you are able to rate, rate the service level from the lowest to the highest point, peak. So it means you are able to classify and put all the categories in order of appearance. For example, the sizes of shoe, you can also put them in order because you've got size one, size two, size three, size four, size five. 
things like that, like clothes, small, medium, extra large, or large, extra large, and double X, and so on. So they've got scales or levels in terms of how you order them. Like also, for the example, the one we use here, the levels of education, preschool, or kindergarten, preschool, uh, primary, secondary, and nowadays we've got foundational FET and so on. We can use those levels because you need to progress through the levels before you cannot start from primary and go to university. You have to go through all the levels up. Then we also have what we call nominal. Nominal, there is no order in that. For example, the color of my eyes, blue, green, yellow, red, whatever the colors of eyes are, there is no order. One does not precede the other. They just, you can just um, categorize them randomly. Or what we can use, um, the provinces, South African provinces, you cannot say one is above the other and so on because it's all the provinces. They are not, you cannot put them in order unless we are measuring something else. And this categories also needs to be mutually exclusive. Therefore, it means one category cannot fall in another. So when I talk about the color of my skin or the color of my eyes, I, I will not have brown and black eyes at the same time, unless if my two eyes are different then I've got a, an anomaly. So it means something out, out of the ordinary. You always have uh, two eyes that looks exactly the same. So for example, like the color of your skin, you cannot say you are black and white at the same time. You only fall into one category of color of skin. Things like that. And that is what we call mutually exclusive. So you cannot fall into the other categories. Are there any questions? Well, we are simplifying it. It, it, it makes sense how you are elaborating. <laughs> hey, cool. Oh, welcome. I didn't know that we've got another person joining because I'm sharing my screen. I'm not able to see who is also on online. Uh, welcome. Uh, and if there are any questions while I'm explaining you, are more than welcome to also stop me and engage uh, on that topic as well. Okay, so moving on to the next thing that we need to learn. So we've learned that you need to understand the type of data that we have, right? So. Now we know that we've got the categorical data. We also have the quantitative data. When you have those kind of data, you need to know how you're going to summarize that data after you have collected it. So you, you developed your questionnaire, you have your, your data somewhere from the primary source or secondary source that you, you use to collect that data. Now you need to classify that, you know, uh, this is numerical data, this is categorical data. Uh, how am I now going to analyze this to answer my research question? That's the next step that we have. So we've got two types of methods that you can use or the two types of analysis that you can do. You can do a descriptive analysis, which is just a method of describing and analyzing your data. So it's summarizing the data and describing it in, in terms of the location, in terms of the dispersion, in terms of the distribution. That is that. It's just to summarize it. And you can summarize it by means of using tables and charts. Uh, like when I talk about tables, I'm talking about like a cross tabulation or a list or a, a contingency table and later when you attend one of the, the sessions later on or when you go on to 
our YouTube channel, you can learn more about what do we mean by the types of tables, like contingency table, what is a contingency table, and what is a list table, and what is uh, a summary table. So you need to go and understand those from that point. And we also have like a frequency distribution table um, as well. So but that is a discussion for another day. You can also um, summarize and visualize it in terms of graphs by using like your bar charts, your pie charts, your uh, histograms, your um, uh, scatter plots, uh, your Pareto's and so on. So you can visualize it. And nowadays some tools have nice visualizations um, that Excel doesn't have, but there are other techniques or other tools out there that you can use like R or um, SAS or Python. Uh, nowadays we do have like uh, Tableau, uh, Power BI. You can use them to create those nice graphs and they improve the visualization types within these um, platforms and tools. Now, um, these days because people become so uh, creative in creating them. So yeah, then the other method that you can use to analyze your data, if you're not visualizing it or putting it in tables, you can use what we call summary statistics. And those are, um, are measures that you develop. Like for example, if you want to understand the average uh, you, under, you want to understand what is the highest value, the maximum value, the minimum value, uh, the middle value, the number that is repeating more. So you use those descriptive uh, statistics or what we call the summary statistics where you describe your data in those measures because, um, and later on we can also discuss about what, what we mean by those um, descriptive measures where we want to look at the location of the data by means of looking at the average, the, the number that is repeating more, which we call it the mode, or the middle value, which we call the median. Um, and also we can use the box plot where we look at the, the, the smallest value, the highest value, the 25 percentiles and all those. Or we can look at dispersions, where we look at how far apart the values are from the mean by means of looking at your standard deviation, your variation, or your coefficient coefficient of variation to look at the risk um, uh, levels or the risk probabilities or the, the weighted risk of um, your values away from the mean and things like that. Or we can look at um, uh, other measures like looking at probabilities and so on. So there are so many other measures um, that you can look at uh, the distribution of your data, looking at the Z scores, which tells you um, are they skewed or uh, positively skewed or negatively skewed. And that will, will also help you when you do your data analytics because the type of method you will need to use in order for you to um, analyze the data that is skewed, you need to know what type of method you need to do or you can use because you cannot use, um, you cannot do a normal distribution type of a method or like, for example, ANOVA test when your data is negatively skewed or is not normally distributed, you cannot do certain tests and so on. So you need to be able to understand those. And later on, we can discuss that. Uh, or you can watch the YouTube videos where we explain in detail the type of uh, analysis that, that you need to do on the type of data that you have based on the analysis that you would have done with your descriptive statistics. So that is how you can summarize and present your data or describe your data. Then we have what we call inferential statistics. And inferential statistics is where we infer or we make prediction about your data. So this method 
will tell you something about your population based on your sample. And later on, we will discuss what population is and what sample is. We will cover it in this session. But inferential statistics is where we infer in a way. So it's inferential infer. <laughs> what we use the sample data to infer what the population should look like. That is why for today's session, we're only going to pick the probability uh, sample method because when you use differential statistics and you are going to infer back the results, you need to make sure that the sample that you are using is a true representation of your population. It's a, re it's a representative of your population. It mimic what the population is. It doesn't have to be exactly 100% like your population, but it should at least align to what your population in terms of proportion or weighting your population would look like. And that is why we need to use the probability sampling. Otherwise, if you don't use the probability sampling method, you will use methods which are non-probability, like convenience and all that, which then the results you, you get out of the analysis, you cannot infer back to the population. They only relate to those group of um, individuals or items that you have studied. You cannot generalize your results, but when you use probability sampling methods, you can generalize your results to your population or to other population, especially if the population looks similar to your sample. Okay, so, but anyway, so the type of method you will use for inferential statistics, there are more around estimation, like your regression, where you estimate the next point or forecasting and so on, where we estimate the population weight or uh, mean or things like that from the sample weight. Or you can use things like hypothesis testing. And later on, we will discuss what hypothesis testing is but we, you can use hypothesis testing to test the claim or assumptions that you want to make about your population based on your sample. So, uh, like I said, inferential statistics is about the process of drawing conclusion or making a decision about the population based on the results you get from your sample. Okay, are there any questions? Is that clear? Yes, so far. So far, so good. Okay, cool. Uh, now, let's talk about, uh, we spoke about inferential statistics and I kept on talking about the population and the sample and so on. So how do we then define those two terminologies? So, Population is a set of all individuals of interest or all elements that you are interested in studying. Okay. When you want to study the whole population, it might be costly, timely, because it might take you forever. For example, in South Africa, we've got almost 60 million or more people. In order for you to study the entire population of South Africa, even the uh, statistics South Africa cannot reach each and every person in South Africa. That is why they use some weightings, and we will talk about the difference between a population and a census. So it's very costly and timely um, because the population is huge, 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 huge. So you cannot reach everyone. So that is the population. And when we do some measures, like we did descriptive analysis of some of the measures, oh, I need coffee or tea or something. My stomach is grumbling. Uh, if you do some calculations based on, let's say you managed, you got some research fund that tells you, you can take two years to go and reach all corners of South Africa and interview everybody in South Africa and try and find out everything you need about South Africans or whoever lives in South Africa, the population of South Africa. Then you come back and you do your analysis. Those analysis 
you are doing, like for example, calculating the average or calculating the uh, the mode, the median, the standard deviation from the population. We call those measures parameters. Um, and now I'm talking too statistical, too technical, but you need to understand parameters. That's what we measure. So that is why you will not uh, be talking about parameters anytime soon. Or even when you are doing your research, you will always not be talking about parameters unless if you are referring to parameters when we are using some of the tools like Python and R and they asking you change this parameter and that is not what we're referring to here. The parameters here are measures that comes from a population. So since the population is big and we cannot study it, uh, we know that it's challenging. Uh, then we need to sample out from that population and create this small group of individual or items that is manageable, that is not going to take us forever to analyze. Um, and we're going to analyze that. And that is what we call a sample. A sample is just a subset of your population. And that is why we're going to discuss the sampling method on terms of how do you do that? How do you select that sample? So once you have your sample, which is your subset, that small group, the measures you calculate from there, like your mean, your mode, your standard deviation and all that, those measures are what we call statistics. And that is the term you're going to be learning about throughout statistics. That is why when we say we are inferring what we learned about, or we are inferring what we've learned from the sample data about the population, this is what we mean. So because we're using the sample statistics or the sample measures to estimate what the population would look like, and that is why, the terminology, the term statistics will go on and on and on because every time we do an analysis, we are using statistics. Right. I hope that clarifies um, what statistics is and what parameter is and why we say statistical research. It's because we're using the sample. We're not using the population. Okay. So how do we then draw this sample? So you can draw this sample by using so many other methods out there. But I'm only going to concentrate on the three prob probability sample methods. Like I explained previously, there are probability sample method, sampling methods and there are non-probability sampling methods. And the non-probability sampling methods are like your convenient sampling method, uh, uh the other one there are other methods i i it's just that for today i my 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 mind is not there yet um but we have this probability sampling method and with this probability sampling method what we're trying to do is with every decision that we make or we come to for using the sample statistics we want to infer those results back to the population. And to do that, we can apply the different methods. And we've got three methods that we can use. The simple one is called a simple random sampling method. And the simple random method, it's just a method of selecting every possible sample with the same number of observation, which is likely to be chosen. For example, we say every member who is part of that population has a likelihood or equal chance of being selected to be part of the population. That's what we're trying to do. So let's say, for example, you are studying at the University of Pretoria. All students at the University of Pretoria are classified as population, but you're only interested in learning 
uh, about those students who are studying a particular program. Then you're going to select only from those who are doing your, uh, we can narrow our population, not from being the University of Pretoria, but being from that program. So now our population has narrowed. So it's everyone who's studying at the University of Pretoria who's studying in that program. So let's assume that there were thousand of students doing that program. Now, in order for me to select a sample of 20 students from that program, I need to make sure that every person who is in that program has a likelihood or a chance, an equal chance of being selected. And I'll go and select one person and I go and select another person and I go and select another person until I get my sample. That is just simple random sampling method. Everyone has an equal chance of being included in that sample. Then we have what we call a, oh, another good example is if you have ever participated in a draw where they say, everybody who is here, buy a raffle ticket and put your, your name in the head and someone goes and da 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 da, -da the, in the head, put their hands and they pull out a name. That is what we call a simple random sampling because everybody whose name was in that head from it's a population that everybody who was in that had an equal chance of being selected, but we only selected that one person, things like that. So nowadays when you are watching TV and there is that draw uh, that they do for net bank PSL thingy, you must always remember simple random sampling. Everybody who is in that ball, a bowl, had an equal chance of being selected and paired with another team. That simple random sampling. So it will not go away from your mind. You will be teaching your children as well going forward. I'm just joking. Then we have what we call a stratified random sample. A stratified random sample also. Everybody has an equal chance of being selected, but you need to make sure that you select mutually exclusive groups. So for example, if you know that you're going to be classifying people in terms of race, language, and so on, you need to group them into those groups, subgroups. So for example, I need to make sure that I select uh, black people, white people, colored people, Indian people, white, uh, Chinese people, whatever the groups you have. You are going to take all of them and place them in different groups. And from those different groups, you're going to go and select your sample from that. So if you are going to use proportionate sampling, for example, you will look at, let's say you've got a population of 60% uh, African, 20% uh, colored, 10% this, 10% that. So you're going to select 60% of your sample will be from black people. So 60% you select from that black people. 20% you select from those colored people. 10% you select from white people. And then that will create your sample from that. So let's say you wanted 20 people. So 60% of 20. Uh, now I need to use a calculator. What is 60% of 20? And I'm a statistician. I don't know these things by heart because I didn't train my mind to be like that. So let's say I need 20 people and 60% of black people. So it means 12 people will be from uh, the black people group. So I'm going to go there and select 12 people, one after the other so that until I have 12 people, so everybody in the black community would have had equal chance of being selected. Uh, and then we have uh, what we call cluster sampling, where also clustering or cluster sampling, it's almost like your stratified random sampling, but with cluster sampling, you also group your people into clusters. So you group them. So for example, you can say, uh, if I live here in Cape Town, everybody in city of Cape Town is one cluster. Everybody in 
the Karu is one cluster. Anybody in the um, uh, Stellenbosch uh, is one cluster. So I'll go and select, depending on how many people I need, I'll go and select 10 people from uh, City of Cape Town, 10 people from Stellenbosch, 10 people from the Karu, 10 people from wherever I select until I make up my cluster. So it looks almost similar. But stratified, you use proportionate as well. Okay, so you do have other sampling, like for example, um, the KNF method sampling, um, the inconvenience sampling, and the convenient sampling is like um, what the researcher prefers. And those are non probability sampling methods because what the researcher um, can just walk through the street and say, uh, I want to interview this person. And I walk down the street and I see that one and I'm like, ah, that one doesn't look like they are friendly. I pass them and I go to the next one. Then the k and method, you do it systematically. So it's what we call a systematic random sampling where you, you systematically select. So you first initially say from the first house, if you're doing by house or so from the first house, then I'm going to select the next fifth house in the row. So you go and you, you go to the fifth house, fifth, and so on, until you have collected all your samples. But those are type of sampling methods. Like I said, there are so many, but these three are the most used and relied on methods, especially if you want to use probability sampling methods, because uh, using stratified random sampling might get you the proportion in, in terms of the um, the relation between your sample and your population and it, you might get it, the ratio right and when you get the results you are able to generalize those results back to the population are there any questions we are on the roll and since i have been talking a lot i don't like to talk by myself. Are there any questions? I usually have some like questions and activities that we go through, but for today, I thought, no, let me not uh, scare you so that you can participate in future events. Are there any questions? Um. I, I, let me ask at the end. I have a question, uh, but it's it's, it's uh, on a qualitative research about sampling. But I'll ask it at the at the end. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm gonna leave at least. Um, yeah, we're almost done by half past. We should be done with my slides, and then we can have any conversation we. We want for the next 30 minutes until 12 o'clock. So let's get on to it. And we are almost there. So we've been talking about the how what the statistical research would look like. Remember, we started by explaining that you need to formulate your research question. So your research question will uh, have some assumptions that you would want to use in order for you to answer that research question. So those assumptions are what we call hypothesis testing statements. Let's put it that way. So we need to, hy to hypothesize that question and maybe create multiple hypotheses because in a quantitative research or any other research, usually they will say have a research question and under your research question, you have your research objectives. And those research objectives should have hypothesis testing statement, or they can have sub research questions. Or sometimes they say have a research aim or the high overarching and then the sub research questions, things like that. So depending on the structure and your way you are studying, you must follow what they ask you to do. But usually, when you create your research question, you will have your research objectives and your research objectives will be linked to your hypothesis testings. Most time, 
or you can create your research questions and sub research questions and those sub research questions will have uh, your hypothesis testing so that you can answer those research questions that you have All right so how do we do hypothesis testing so a hypothesis testing is just a method of testing your view or your assumptions that you have so if you've got a claim how do we prove that claim that's hypothesis testing the first thing that you need to always remember is to make sure that you state your hypothesis testing statements and there are two hypothesis statements that you need to play so or you need to test there is a null hypothesis statement and there is a alternative hypothesis so that is what we call always there is two sides two sides to the coin or of a coin something like that or let's use the normal one that we use in law we say uh, you need to be proven guilty or not I, let me not use that because I'm, I'm i'm gonna butcher it in a way but you either guilty or not guilty so how do we prove that you are not guilty something like that that's what hypothesis testing is about so you've got your null hypothesis which is what you want to prove what the researcher is claiming to be true and you have your alternative which is the opposite of that um play so you always have those two side so you have a head and a tail you want to prove that the coin is, is landing on a tail and you say no it's going to be landing on a tail on a head so, something like that then you need to also define what type of a method you're going to be using. So the way you the way you pose your hypothesis testing statement also has different things that can influence what will happen at a later stage. So you need to be very careful when you state your hypothesis testing. And when we when we go into uh, quantitative statistical research in detail, you will learn that when you state those null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, what are the things that you, you need to be stating or what are, what are you trying to prove? For example, is it a one directional test or is it a two directional test? So is it a less than or equal uh, or not equal and is it greater than? Those kind of things, you need to understand them. Um, we do discuss this in detail in some of the videos on YouTube, so you can go and follow. But at the later stage, we are also going to discuss some of these techniques um, in more detail. So we will have a, section, a session where we discuss hypothesis testing. So, but uh, let's not go into detail. So once you have your hypothesis statements developed, then you need to define what the decision method would be. So like I said, with those directional and non-directional, they will help you. How are you going to make your decision? Are you going to be using a one-directional test or are you going to be using a two-directional test? And that will help when you're making a decision because we have what we call some of these statistical tests that we do and they produce some um, calculation or some values called the p-values or the critical values and all those we use them to make those decisions and in order for you to know whether are you doing a one directional whether is it a one tail test or a two tail test or are you doing both sides you need to understand those decision methods well in advance before you even go into your analysis so that then when you get to the conclusion and you make your conclusions you know what you are concluding about then you need to understand how do you do the calculations you will go and collect that data that you have and all that but you need to know what method or statistical uh, technique i'm gonna call it technique or test statistic which is a calculation or a formula that you will need to use to calculate are you doing an ANOVA or are you doing a t-test or are you doing a z-test or are you doing an F test, things like that. So you need to know um, what is it that you're going to be calculating and make sure that also when you do those, because there are some assumptions that you need to be aware of as well. So 
if I'm going to uh, be given or working only with sample data with no population data, then it means I must know that I'm doing a t-test. And this is the formula to use to calculate in that t-test or whatever, if I'm using Excel or I'm using another program, I need to be sure that I am selecting the right statistical test for it. Once you have done the statistical test, you've calculated it, it produces some summary statistics or some measures, then you go and use those measures and make your conclusion or the decision whether to reject your null hypothesis or to accept it. Usually we reject or do not reject the null hypothesis and make your conclusion and revert back to your research question and say, true, this is that. But in a statistical research manner, once you get to this point, you also need to look at what other people have said before and relate it to that, whether it does your results get supported by previous researchers or not, that is part of the conclusions that you will be writing when you write in your research papers or research articles. But for the purpose of this session, we're just going to concentrate on, on making decisions based on the information that is in front of you. Okay, so we will have a session that delves deep into the hypothesis testing. How do we do it? How do we calculate it? How do we use, how do we interpret the results and so on? How do we make decisions out of it? But these are the steps that you always need to remember that when you're going to prove that hypothesis, if you didn't have, if you didn't follow some of this, then it means you are missing some of the steps in between. So now, you know what hypothesis testing is all about. You have your research question, you have stated your hypothesis, but before you do that, because you know your topic might say, uh, I want to predict, or I want to find the relationship between uh, student performance and race, something like that. It's just an awkward question. Uh, a research question that I'm posing. So the minute I put there, is there a relationship between student performance and race? The key word there, relationship. Student performance, is it in categorical data or is it in numerical data? Race, it's categorical data. So I need to think. If I'm going to be using categorical data, then I also need to know which statistical test I need to be doing. So that is what we are coming at at this point. So what you are going to be testing or what the research questions you have has an implication in terms of how you're going to select which test, statistical test, like I spoke about assumptions needs to be met. For example, if you want to test whether there is a difference between one group, which means males, performance of males, is there a difference between performance of males? You need to also ask your question, do I have the population standard deviation or I don't have the population standard deviation? When you are able to answer that question, then you will know which statistical test you're going to be doing or using. Whether you're using R, Python, Excel, irregardless, because you need to ask yourself, am I testing the difference between one group? Am I given the population standard deviation? If I'm given the population standard deviation, I know what the population standard deviation is, which is the um, Uh, the measure of dispersion, then I need to do a z-test. So it means I'm going to be using a z-test statistic. If my population standard deviation is unknown, I'm only using my sample data and I've got my sample test statistics. Uh, oh, sorry, my sample statistics, which is my sample standard deviation, then I'm going to use a t-test.
one group. You need to ask yourself those. If I need to ask, and my question says I need to find the difference between two groups, two groups, males and female, and they need to be independent. Oh, probably, oh no, let me not get to that independent and dependent. So if I'm going to be uh, finding the difference between, my research question is find the difference between two groups, males and females, or two groups, those who are doing first level, something like that. I need to ask myself two questions. Are these two groups dependent or independent? What do I mean by dependent and independent? Dependent groups, they influence one another. One group can be in another group. For example, first level, therefore it means if I'm, let's say, for example, I'm looking at uh, students who are uh, doing uh, modules in this program. They can be doing modules in that program, different modules at the same time. So it's dependent groups. So there are not, one, one person can be in, in multiple groups. They are dependent on each other. Independent groups, they do not have any bearing on one another. So they are distinct. One group does not have any characteristics of the other group, or one person cannot be in two groups. Males and females, if I'm using gender identities of those both groups, person identifies as male and person identifies as female, those are two groups. So if I'm doing two independent groups, I need to know that I am looking at the differences of means between those two groups, and I'm going to use what test of uh, type of test statistics. I'm going to be using independent groups. If I'm using two dependent groups, I'm going to be using two independent groups, but pair matched. For example, these are what we call the befores and the after. So I can do a test before and a test after of same thing. So for example, what I always say is I can test the performance of my staff before they go for training. So this is what they their performance look like. So in terms of if I work in the call center, I would say the measures from that, um, uh, the ratings from um, from the survey that we got before they, they went on a customer service training. So I got these ratings and they go on a service training workshop and I then take the ratings after that. So before and after, and I can compare both of those groups. So that is what we call dependent groups, the before and after. Controls, uh, and uh, I think in 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 um, what do you call in health they usually say the controls and the placebos or something like that. So you get those who get the drugs or before they before the drug and after the drug or something like that. So it's not the same. So in, the independent will be those who receive the drug and those who don't receive the drug. Those are two independent groups. But if I look at before they take a drug and after they take a, a drug, and I want to look at their behavior, did it change? Is there a difference before and after? Then you are doing a dependent groups. So you need to know which ones you are using because if you look at the statistical tests, you will see that there are different, the method in which you are calculating. Even if it's a t-test, but they are different in a way that you are going to be calculating them. Therefore, it means the results you're going to be getting would be different. Now, when we talk about the relationship, so is there a relationship between two groups? Those things that you need to ask yourself is, am I looking at numerical data or categorical data? If I'm looking at numerical data, remember the numerical data can be classified as a ratio or uh, interval. 
So if I'm looking at two numerical data, then I'm going to use what we call a Pearson R test. We all know that those correlation numbers that we get, 80% correlated, 20% correlated, or negatively correlated, or positively correlated, those are the ones we're going to be looking at. If I'm looking at two categorical data, therefore, I'm going to be looking at what we call a chi-square for independent. What is missing here, uh, usually, um, is not really related to those who are in, like, educational research or psychological research or... Uh, or I think also in health, you normally don't do that. Uh, but in in um, things like insurance, finance, and all that, they can use that. It's what we call a goodness of fit test, which only looks at one one uh, numerical data, a relationship between that. So we look at that one numerical data, but we're looking at two groups, and. Um, then we use what we call a goodness of fit test because we want to find that relationship. But if I'm looking at two categorical data, then I'm going to be using what we call a Pearson chi-square test. Okay. What we just spoken about here are parametric tests. So parametric test, it means we're making assumptions that our population is normally distributed, usually. Therefore, we can use this. There are other tests that you can run, which when you use those tests, you cannot generalize the data as well. Uh, what we call a non-parametric test. Like, for example, you can look at um, different um, other tests like Wilcox test, which looks at the difference between two groups, uh, which almost similar to what independent groups are. Uh, we also have a Wilcox sign rank test where it looks at the before and after. Uh, but the results you get from those tests, you cannot generalize. So, if, for example, if you know that you use convenience uh, sampling method, then you cannot use any of these methods. You will need to use those methods that I referred to. Uh, there is also um, Spearman, also for non-normal distributed data. Um, we will discuss those in detail in other, in other sessions as well. But these are just uh, some of the concepts and methodologies and techniques that you need to learn and know uh, in order for you to do your quantitative uh, statistical research uh, where actually you want to make assumptions about your population and you want to infer back. And on that note, I think that was my last session when it comes to the content. And I think we are right on time. I said we will finish at half past 11 and we are at that point. So remember also, we do have a, I do have a YouTube channel. It's not a company YouTube channel, but I'm interchangeably using it as both. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Remember to go there and subscribe. You can also join a channel uh, by means of supporting me because uh, running free sessions like this for two hours, it means uh, they don't pay bills, uh, but I, I do appreciate the support that people give. So you can subscribe or join the YouTube channel and uh, pay a small fee of subscription. Some videos are free to watch. Like, for example, today's session video will be free. I will upload it. Everybody can watch it. But some videos are only geared to those who subscribe and pay a subscription fee uh, as well. So, but feel free to go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It has grown and I really support or I thank those who subscribe to my channel um, and they keep me going. And also do comment on some of the 
the the videos and give me suggestions in terms of what other topics you might be interested in in future and so on. If you want to get hold of me or us in Pambili Analytics, these are our contact details. Uh, you can find us also on uh, the website or email or WhatsApp. From us, Pambili Analytics, where success and data analytics matters, that's where we are and we support you. So let's have a discussion, a questions, Q&A session. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can see you. Um, are there any questions? What can I see? On that note, if there are no questions, adios. See you next time. Bye.